today a conversation with Dmitry Nemirovsky, co-founder and CEO of Atacama. Our conversation is on the difference between cybersecurity and information security, the mess of delivering all this, and the broad-reaching conversation about incentives. This is a bonus episode of The Business of Tech. So context to start this is you guys are delivering a cybersecurity focused product, but you've got some particular thinking around the difference between cybersecurity and information security. Help me out there. How are you defining those two and what's the difference? That's right. And there is a difference. I'll start there. And I think over the past decade or so, I think a lot of folks have forgotten that there's a difference. Cybersecurity, I view as an umbrella term. Cybersecurity applies across the board to everything that a security professional is focused on in connection with securing their environment, their network. And the way I like to think of cybersecurity is really the perimeter, right? Uh, if you think of the walls around a uh, castle, right? And everything that the security professional does to ensure that those walls are not penetrated, right? So making them really thick really high, making that moat in front of the wall really deep so that the adversary has a very difficult time getting in. That's the way I analogize cybersecurity. Information security is singularly focused on protecting data. And if you think of the cybersecurity tech stack and the way that most professionals come at the cybersecurity tech stack, they're really focused on the perimeter. And there are very few products out there that focus specifically on data, right? And that's, that's really the way I analogize and differentiate between cybersecurity on the one hand and what information security should be and the way security professionals should come about approaching information security. Okay, so the obvious first follow-up for me there is, is so cybersecurity, it's already lost. We're, we're done. Uh, the, with People have now dispersed to remote working. We don't have single uh, perimeters anywhere. So are we done? Like, do we move on from that entirely and just abandon cybersecurity entirely? So a lot of security uh, professionals, their mindset is, let's assume that the adversary has already penetrated the network, right? And that's not a bad posture to take. That's not a bad security posture to really make sure that your infrastructure is as secure as it could possibly be. So the answer is no, we shouldn't give up. But we also need to appreciate the fact that irrespective of how awesome and secure your cyber tech stack may be, no matter how impenetrable those walls are, and now to your point, yeah, there's a lot of mini walls, mini fiefdoms, right? Given that everyone's dispersed and all the employees are now remote. At the end of the day, the weakest link is the human element. And that's really where the focus needs to be. So I don't care how impenetrable your cybersecurity tech stack may be, how awesome your policies and procedures may be, it is that human element. And the attacks that we see being perpetrated and the successful attacks that we read about in the headlines are the ones that socially engineer an attack against the human element, right? So again, going back to that analogy, right? It's really tricking, uh, you know, the gatekeeper and opening the gates because the delivery that they're bringing in is in fact a Trojan horse, but it, you know, they've mocked it up to look like it's a delivery of milk from the local farmer. Right. Okay. So, I will buy all that, but I will, I will sort of push a little bit and say, like, look, if we've already assumed the networks are, are already hacked, uh, we might as well not spend so much time there if we're just assuming that they're hacked and focus, as in your context, on information security. So help me understand that in that context, why is this space such a mess? Like, what, what, what is going on that makes it so bad? And, and to be clear, I don't, I don't think we need to give up. I think, you know, um, any security professional needs to continuously focus on that perimeter and making sure that the adversary is not making their way in. I think the mess really comes into play is that there's a lot of confusion out there. There are a lot of competing products. Um, you know, uh, if, if you look at, you know, uh, something as simple as a data discovery and classification tool, right? Something along those lines, more often than not, to the extent someone's using those tools, they may not be using it to 
the full extent and, and, and power that such a tool can actually bring to the table. Um, so, you know, the issue really, I think it, it's not befuddling in any way, but the issue really is how do I create a cybersecurity program that I, as an administrator, can manage to its full extent, right, without keeping me up at night and forgetting to do certain things and where that, that weakest link, that human element, right, is not left to their own devices. So I need to secure not only the perimeter, but the end points of all of my employees who were now dispersed across, you know, potentially thousands of locations, right? right. So um, it's a challenging job. And in a lot of ways, it's a thankless job. It's a thankless job because no one's patting you on the back and saying, hey, we didn't get hacked today. Good job. Kudos to you. Right. It's always one of those situations where if things go south, right, someone's questioning that security professional and saying, well, with the benefit of hindsight, mind you, why did we not have this, that and the other thing? Right. So, um, you know, I will add one huge component to why it's such a big mess. Budget. The security professional is challenged not only with implementing a proper security infrastructure, he's also challenged with convincing the business folks, hey, I need sufficient budget to do my job, right? And I speak to security professionals on a daily basis. And in addition to the, 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 the daily struggle in propping up that tech stack, they're also fighting with the business people because they're a cost center. Right. They're fighting with the business people, trying to get that budget so that they, in fact, can create that proper infrastructure. But sometimes their hands are tied and they need to you know, pick the, the, the worst of the evils in order to make sure that they're doing their job to the best of their ability. I want to put forth then a premise. So your, your statement here is, is that it, the, the business isn't investing enough because of the, the forces and the budget and the constraints. But I want to put forth another thing. Theory, and I want to hear your reaction to it. I think incentives are all wrong. Uh, I think, let me, let me observe. I, I understand why the criminals do what they do, right? Super lucrative, right? They're making, they're making bank. They're doing really, really well. Uh, and I understand, by the way, why cybersecurity products are offered. They're also making money trying to address this problem. But let's talk about the business for a moment. There's no actual real financial damage besides writing a check for cleanup. If I look at Equifax, if I look at Marriott, if I look at Target, if I look at all of them from a business perspective, they had no long-term damage to their valuation. When I look at it from a business valuation, from a stock price, like it didn't matter really that they were breached and they lost data. They just wrote a check for cleanup and they were done. So if, if why would a business person look at this and not just say, "Look, this is just this is just it. I'm just going to write a check. Problem goes away. It doesn't actually hurt my business." Am I is my premise wrong? Because for me, the data says it it's right. Yeah, I think it's perspective. So you're looking at it from you know a performance standpoint, right? Let's say you're an investor in Equifax or Target or Marriott, and they were hit. We all know high profile hits. And at the end of the day, as an investor, you're looking at the bottom line and saying, well, you know what, six months, 12 months, 18 months after that scab has gone away and their stock price is performing on par. And in fact, that uh, hit that they took with that particular attack, I don't see it manifesting in the stock price. I think there's a valid argument to be made there that for certain companies, a hack may not necessarily translate into financial harm down the road. However, However, and this is key, there are certain industries where if you're hit, right, and it's a, it's a big enough hit where there was meaningful damage, meaning, you know, uh, file exfiltration, data loss, whatever the case may be, um, from, from the following standpoint, uh, anyone who's ever done business with a financial institution, as an example, right, it's called a Bank of America. Any company that does business with Bank of America has to complete a due diligence questionnaire. And that due diligence questionnaire is incredibly thorough. And if you answer, yes, I was hit, and here's what happened, you're going to have a very difficult time getting the contract or whatever business dealings you're hoping to achieve with Bank of America. Those due diligence questionnaires have become the norm, right? So if you look at it from the standpoint of a law firm, we know certain law firms are hit and law firms do not suffer that same headline noise that a Marriott or a Target um, or an Equifax suffer, right? So, you know, a, a law firm who was hit with a cyber attack 
is going to find it very difficult to get continuous business from some of their customers because those do, those due diligence questionnaires, right, are quite lengthy. They're extensive. They're detailed. And if I'm evaluating a due diligence questionnaire and, you know, I have company X and company Y and I'm comparing the two and company X was hit, chances are I'm going to give the business to company Y, right? So as a practical matter, I think there are actual financial damages that could occur down the road as a result of a hack. I would also say that reputational harm, um, regulatory uh, scrutiny, those are real you know, uh, incentives for companies to ensure that they're buttoned up. Regulatory exams can be extraordinarily expensive, both after a cyber attack and on an ongoing basis, because the regulator now has you in their sights. And if you were hit, they're going to look at your remediative measures. What did you undertake in order to ensure that you're not going to be hit again? How did you, you know, resolve? And if investors were harmed, what are you doing there? In other words, paying for the Equifaxes of the world to do, you know, the credit monitoring, things like that. So I think there are very direct consequences, both from a financial reputation, regulatory standpoint, commercial standpoint. And it really depends on the perspective with which you're looking at these things, right? And it, you know, it, it's interesting. Your question started by looking at hacks that happened probably four or five years ago at this point, and they're still front and center, right? So maybe that scab isn't fully gone, right? And there's still some remnants of a scar left over. I think I'll smile and go, nah, because last I checked, none of those companies are struggling. They're not having any difficulty there. Not only is their stock up, it's up a lot. And if you look at the, and if you look at the, the graphs, I did a, an editorial video diving into this. If you look at the graphs, you can't tell where they were hacked. They're doing so well. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll sort of smile and go by my current evidence of this is, I don't know, solar winds, right? Who's already their stock ticking along back to go back up their revenue reporting recently, not so bad. And I think their damage was pretty main, like they are na literally synonymous with a major hack, but are reporting no, no significant drop in revenue right away. I don't know. Now it's, I think there's, there's some space here, but the reason I'm pushing on this is, is that, that I want to talk a little bit then about the, uh, the risk model, because, you know, in the way that we're talking about this, obviously we know the criminals don't have risk. They just have upside, right? So, so on one side of the equation, but on the other side of the equation, we've got customers, right? Clearly that are the, are the target. And then we've got companies that are, that are looking to sell solutions in here that have plenty of solutions, right? Products that, that are saying, but they don't really come with a guarantee. I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, Quote your own website because I just want to understand you. Uh, you you say can nullify any attempt or ransom or otherwise uh, or otherwise extort company files. That's right from the website, right? So my first question will be: Well, how do they know they're absolutely covered, right? How do you know? It's it's a good question, right? Um, so you know, um, and you know what? I, uh, before I answer that question, I do want to mention one more thing. With respect to your prior question, I think it's an important one. If you look at some companies, and in fact, I was on the phone with a company yesterday where they were hit twice. They're a small clinic, uh, women-owned, right? Small clinic. They have about two dozen employees. And they literally told us that if we are hit again, we are out of business. So it's an existential threat to them, right, in particular. Right. So I think your question also has to be, you know, qualified based on the target itself. So uh, okay. huge multinational corporations, you're probably right. You know, they'll take it on the chin and they'll move over, move, move on and they'll continue to be successful. But I think if you, you know, notch it that down to, um, you know, companies that do not have the balance sheet of, of the Equifaxes of the world, they actually can get hit pretty bad and it really could be a do or die situation. So I think it's important to mention that as well. Um, with respect to security guarantees, I think it's very important to understand the particular software and what that software is, it, the challenge, the value proposition that it's bringing to the table. So sure. using our security guarantee, and there are certain security guarantees that I can prove, right, categorically. One of those is with our software, anything that is encrypted with Atacama software, the adversary on a wholesale basis will be prevented from file exfiltrating that information. What do I mean by that? If you look at a lot of the attacks that we see these days, right, where the adversaries become very sophisticated 
and their attack is no longer, hey, let me lock these things up and give you the decryption key. I'm actually going to steal this stuff. And if the stuff that I'm stealing happens to be customer information, well, now I can put the screws to you really tightly because releasing your information, yeah, that sucks for you. But releasing your customer information, that's exponentially worse for you. Um, and based on those threats, that's how they're able to extort uh, the company from whom they you know, uh, have, have exfiltrated, stolen the data. With our software in particular, one of our security guarantees is the adversary would be unable on a wholesale basis to exfiltrate, steal anything that is encrypted with our data. They'll steal the files, but it's the encrypted version of the file. And um, we can prove that that is in fact the case because I can literally publish the credential, my login credentials to OneDrive as an example, right? Or Dropbox, Box, Google Drive. And you'd be able to access the files, you'd see the files, but you would see the ciphertext encrypted version of the file. And that's because of the way that we've designed our system. So I think your question is actually, you know, excellent in that regard is because when you're undertaking uh, an analysis of the product that you are purchasing, what is it that you hope to get out of that product, right? That f fundamental question, I think, should be the question every security professional should be asking from soup to nuts with across their cybersecurity tech stack, right? Including on, a, on, a, on an annual basis, did this thing, you know, do what it proved that it was going to do? Did I get my money's worth? And I think that annual audit, and as you move forward, as you're buying new products and introducing them into your environment, what are you hoping to accomplish? And can the company stand behind that value proposition? Okay, so I'm following so far. Um, how does a user or a, or a partner or an MSP or IT service provider, how do they know their that guarantee is is good because by by the beginning from the beginning of the conversation we both know that people are the big problem right people are the big problem so how do they know that something isn't misconfigured or somebody isn't going to click something like how do they know you've made a guarantee we know it will do this but i'm but there have to be certain criteria that it matches how do they know that the two are in alignment that's, that's a great point. And I think that's uh, where a lot of security professionals struggle, right? They struggle because they believe that they've implemented it the right way, but can one individual or a team on an ongoing basis ensure that all of these systems, all of these processes are running in accordance with um, the terms of use, right? At, did I implement this properly? So a lot of it has to do with testing. Right. One of the things that we encourage all of our customers to do out of the box before anything is to test. Is this the right solution for you? Right. Very rarely, you know, when 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 um, uh, a customer wants to jump to sign the dotted line, we put a pause on it. Right. That's something we do systematically. Let's test this thing. Let's get a proof of concept going. And you should try to kick the tires as much as possible. Try to break the thing. Right. Challenge yourself. Put yourself in the shoes of that adversary. There are also third party providers that can do that for you. Right. The black hats of the world. Right. The white white hats of the world. Right. The, the purple teams that will go in there and try to, you know, not only pen test, uh, but I think it's a wonderful idea to test and understand what the environment looks like. Right. Um, you know, we get emails often that say, um, you know, uh, hey, we found the vulnerability and blah, 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 blah. And it's clear from the email that they have no clue what we do, right? Uh, because if they did, they wouldn't, you know, um, uh, uh, send us the text that they did. Um, but at the end of the day, there's some validity to that, right? And you do want, you know, the testing. You do want potentially that, that company to come in and not only reassure you that you've implemented it properly, but that the product itself, right, is delivering on the value proposition that it is actually you know there to achieve for you. Gotcha. Well, Dimitri, if people want to learn more about what you guys are doing and the product and stuff, how can they get more information? Well, on our website, we have a wonderful website. It's www.atacama with a K dot com. Uh, they can also email us at info at atacama dot com. Uh, we're eager to demo the software. We also have uh, every two weeks a live uh, fifteen minute lunch break. Uh, which I tend to do. And it's uh, 15 minutes where I do a demonstration and then some Q&A. It's a wonderful way to learn about our product and our solution. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. 
thanks for listening to this bonus episode of the business of tech. If you like it, hit the like button and hit that red subscribe button. It really does make a difference and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I'm doing. You want to discuss more? Want to find out more about the interview? Go ahead and put something in the comments. I read them all and I look forward to the ongoing discussion. If you want to get content like this every single day, the five minute Business of Tech podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are found. Go to businessof.tech, click the blue subscribe button. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Additionally, if you want to help me with the content that I create, you can support me directly. Go to patreon.com slash MSP radio and click the button there. You choose what the content is worth and get access to these interviews and discussion episodes early. They come out for my Patreons and Patreons drive the discussion and ask questions directly. Looking forward to ongoing conversations and thanks for watching.